Hello, health champions. Today we're going to talk about the top 10 foods that can help heal a kidney. And the very first, we need to clear up some confusion because usually they just talk about a kidney diet as if that was just one thing, but it makes all the difference what stage of kidney disease do you have? What are we trying to do here? Because the standard recommendations, what they call a kidney diet, that's about restricting certain things, that is not about healing at all. It has nothing to do with it. What they're talking about is to minimize the consequences in advanced cases because the kidney isn't working. So we have to limit certain things so the toxins don't build up too fast. And when we're talking about healing recommendations, when we're actually trying to fix a kidney and restore it back to normal, now we're talking about something completely different. When they classify kidney disease, they divide it into different stages from one to five, where stage three also has an A and a B. And the diagnosis is based on something called creatinine. And the kidneys, as you may know, filters out hundreds of liters of water every day. And with that water follows basically everything that's dissolved, everything except really large particles like red blood cells and proteins. So sodium and glucose and creatinine all filters out with the water, but then the kidney reabsorbs everything of value. So glucose gets reabsorbed at about 100% as long as we're not diabetic. Sodium gets absorbed over 99%, but creatinine gets reabsorbed at zero. So if creatinine rises, that means that the kidney is not flowing very well. There's not enough fluid going out through the kidney. And this is measured in milliliters per minute, and it's called estimated glomerular filtration rate. So they estimate that based on the level of creatinine. And if you're filtering 90 milliliters or more, that means you're either completely normal or it means that you have some sort of kidney problem in stage one that's not related to the filtration volume. It could be that they run a urinalysis and there is protein in the urine or something like that, something different than filtration rate. If you are filtering more than 60, but less than 90, you're called stage two. And kind of ironically, this is called normal on a blood test. So you could be stage one or stage two, and you're still in the normal range for most blood tests because they don't cut it off until 60. The next one goes to 45, that's stage 3A, and then we are down to 30 milliliters with 3B. If you're between 15 and 30, it's called stage four. And if you're less than 15, it's stage five or end stage renal disease. So you're basically at complete failure or very, very close to it. And at this point, pretty much dialysis or a transplant would be the only options. Now on average, about 15% of the population has some sort of kidney compromise where they fit into one of these stages. So that's about one in seven in the world. And 1% out of that 15 is stage five. So we're talking a very small percentage. And here with including stage four, that's 3%. So here we have 4% out of one seven. So we're still less than 1% of the population. And these are the ones that really need to be careful. These need to follow the guidelines very, very strictly and avoid all sorts of things. But then we have the other part. So stage one don't really have that problem at all. They don't need to avoid anything. Stage two also don't need to avoid anything in terms of standard kidney diet. They need to start working on the root cause, what that ever might be, which we're gonna talk about. So that's about 50% of the people who have some sort of kidney compromise. And then in stage three, 3A is twice as common as 3B. So overall, we have about 20% of the people with some kidney problem who need to pay attention. Stage five and four need to pay very, very close attention, but stage 3B 
they are not home free. They need to re limit certain things and be careful with certain things. But the rest, about 80% of the people with kidney disease, the kidney diet really doesn't apply at all because it's about restricting things that the kidney is failing to eliminate. And we have about 20% of people who have that problem and we have 80% who don't. So with stage five kidney disease, that's when the EGFR is less than 15, there is major damage and they need to see a nephrologist. If they're not, if they get a blood work back and they're not working with a nephrologist, they need to see one right away because they're very close to kidney failure. And this is the most extreme version of limiting things. So they need to limit basically everything, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, also nitrogen, which means protein. Nitrogen is the byproduct of protein. And they might even need to limit water because if the kidney is filtering that poorly, then you have to be careful with almost everything that you put in your body. So do these cause chronic kidney disease? And this is the huge confusion. Just because a person with kidney failure needed to avoid these does not mean that they are the cause. Instead, these are resources. We need minerals, we need protein, we need water when we're healthy to avoid getting it. And if we have a mild case, we need these to reverse it. So we have to be very, very clear because so often we make the mistake of saying, if we have to limit these when the kidney is damaged, then they must be the cause and nothing could be further from the truth. So we need them to heal instead. And of course, most important is prevention. So you wanna make the lifestyle changes before you ever get anywhere near this. Food number one is red grapes. So the question is, is that a good food? I got a list of 25 foods that are very often recommended for kidney patients. So we're gonna go through and figure out if they are indeed good foods. So the reason they gave for this one was that it has antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties. So that might be a good thing, but it's kind of irrelevant to kidneys because it has very little to do with how the kidney heals or if it can filter things out. So we also want to look at some things that are associated with kidney problems like phosphorus, potassium, sodium, and sugar. And I added the sugar because most or nobody really associates sugar with a problem as far as kidney goes. So we're going to talk about why that is. But this would be a good food as far as phosphorus, potassium, and sodium. It's pretty low, but that sugar is way too much. And we'll talk about that next. So red grapes is an X. We do not want that on a kidney diet. And in order to understand why that is, we need to understand the causes. The number one cause is type two diabetes. And after that, we have hypertension closely followed and then kidney infections in much smaller percentages. Medications can cause this and it is over the counter drugs and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So these are things that we can buy straight from the store. They are no prescription and they're all your pain medication and all your colds and flus. So you don't wanna use those unless you absolutely have to. Then we have things like lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. So a lot of people know about rheumatoid arthritis that affects joints and, and bones basically. Well, lupus is sort of the same thing, but it goes after soft tissue and the kidney is one of those things that gets attacked. We could also have poisoning from metals or chemicals that can hurt the kidney. So a lot of pesticides, high doses of, of environmental chemicals can create some problems as well. And the reason I wanna talk about sugar in addition to the traditional criteria is that the number one, by far the biggest contributor to kidney disease is type two diabetes. And not only that, but it is the primary cause for hypertension as well. So if we can handle the 
insulin resistance that causes type 2 diabetes and hypertension, we have eliminated probably 90% of kidney disease right there. Number two is apples. And the reason they give is that it's high in fiber and antioxidants. It's like this mantra we keep hearing and also a good source of vitamin C. So again, this could be a good thing, but it's not going to help the kidney all that much. So if we look at the phosphorus, potassium, sodium, then they're very low and this would seem like a good thing. But again, that sugar is kind of high. So does that mean that apples are a bad food? No, not at all. But if we're trying to reverse kidney disease and insulin resistance is a very common, most common part of that, then we're probably not going to be reversing insulin resistance and kidney disease if we keep eating sugar. However, for someone who is very metabolically healthy, then they might get away with eating a few apples and some fruit and some sugar here and there, as long as they know where they are on the metabolic spectrum, so to speak. So I would put a question mark there because then it would depend on where they are and how much they eat. So it's not like a clear cut case, but for most people, because most chronic kidney disease is due to insulin resistance, we are not going to put apples on this list. Number three is onions. And they say that's a good thing because they provide flavor without adding a lot of potassium. So let's see if that's true. And we have good numbers on most of it. Potassium is not too high and sugar is not bad either. So as long as you don't eat an entire meal, like if you make onion soup and you eat a pound or a couple of pounds, then you might get in trouble with the potassium. But the way most people eat onions, we can give that a check mark. Number four is cauliflower, one of my favorite foods. I eat a lot of it. They say it's low in potassium and a good source of vitamin C and fiber. So let's see if that's true. Phosphorus is low. Potassium is 299. So in my book, that's not really a low potassium food. On the contrary, I often tell people that typically when people are healthy, they, they're looking for sources of potassium and cauliflower is a great source of potassium. Uh, 299 is a pretty good number, but not only that, how much of it can you eat? So cauliflower being a very low carb, very water rich food, there's an opportunity to get tons of potassium. So if you have a tiny bit as a side dish, you're probably fine, but we're going to put a question mark on that. And why is that? What does the question mark mean? It means that something in here is kind of high. So it depends on how much you're going to eat of it. So let's say that you make mashed potatoes or cauliflower mash, then it could be a serious issue if you are in these groups, the three B, four and five that need to restrict this. So that means your EGFR is less than 45. And if you ate one pound of cauliflower, which is not that big a deal, if you steam it and you squeeze some water out and you make mashed cauliflower as a potato substitute, it would be pretty easy to get in the neighborhood of 1500 milligrams of potassium. So is that a lot? Well, let's look at that. So if you're stage three and four kidney disease, that means there's moderate to severe damage. And they say that you should restrict sodium to less than 2000. I don't necessarily agree with that, but we'll, we'll go with it for now. And they say that phosphorus needs to be less than a thousand, but then protein between 60 to 80. So that's kind of a low to, to moderate, more on the low side. And again, it's mostly for stage four that you need to restrict that. But then we're talking about potassium is why is that so important? Because if you can't eliminate potassium, if your kidneys are out of shape, then as potassium builds up, it could slow down your heart. And in extreme cases, it could stop your heart altogether. So absolutely, we want to avoid that. So if you're in stage 3A, they say you're still filtering well enough that it's not a problem. In 3B, they want to limit your potassium 
to 3000 milligrams. And if you're in stage four, they want to limit it to less than 2000. So if you try to heal your kidney with a keto diet, which wouldn't be a bad idea, and you eat tons and tons of cauliflower, then that could easily get above those limits, especially with, with other things that you probably eat. And even though these limits are there to limit the consequences of if you already have some kidney damage, we want to understand that there's still hope here. There's still some regenerative capacity in the kidney if we start doing the right things. Number five is garlic. And the reason they say it's good is that it may have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. So garlic shows up a lot. It's a medicinal herb and it is very powerful. I don't think there's any problem in taking it for all sorts of reasons. Now, if we look at the minerals here, phosphorus is, is kind of high, potassium is really high, sodium sugar is really low. But we have to remember that garlic is not something you're going to eat a pound of. And if you have a couple of cloves or even a whole bulb, you're not going to get enough that that potassium is really going to be a problem. And on that note, I probably want to mention ginger also, which is very similar in terms of medicinal properties, antibacterial, antifungal. It does a lot of good. And again, you're not going to eat a pound of ginger. It's pretty potent. So you have a, a few grams or an ounce or so. You're not going to be in trouble because you're not eating much of it. So we put a check mark on both of those. Number six is cabbage. And they say that it contains phytochemicals with anti-inflammatory properties. Again, that's probably a good thing. It may assist the kidney a little bit in healing, but in terms of a kidney diet, it's kind of irrelevant because we're trying to limit things that the kidney can't filter. So that doesn't really relate at all. But when we look at what it contains, the things that we might need to avoid, they're all very low. So we don't have a problem with cabbage. If you did a cabbage soup diet where that's all you eat, then that might create some problems. But if you just kind of use it normally, no problem. Number seven is cherries. They say they have antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties. So you hear how most of these foods, that's the reason they give and nobody really knows why. It's like they're just repeating a mantra. They don't really know why these foods belong on the list or not. We've just heard these things. They must be good for something. Eat more plants and fruit. But we want to understand the, the reasons so that we can do the right thing for our situation. So phosphorus is low. Potassium is, is up a little bit. But the big one here, again, is the sugar. And if we're trying to reverse insulin resistance, which is the root cause of most kidney problems, then Cherries is not something that we want to eat a lot of. Number eight is bell pepper. And they say it's low in potassium and high in vitamin A and C. The red and the green are slightly different. And the one that sticks out as maybe getting a little bit high is the potassium. So if you just have a few slices on the side, not a problem. But if you do like a stir fry with fajitas and you do tons and tons of of bell pepper and onion, you might get up a, a little bit too high. And the green is very similar, but you notice that it would probably be the better option if you're trying to really restrict potassium. So we're going to give it a question mark. It's probably all right the way most people eat it, but the question marks there just to say that it would depend on how much you eat. Number nine is berries. They say that they're low in potassium and a good source of vitamin C and fiber. So I love berries. Let's see how they do. And we're pretty low in all of these numbers. Uh, raspberries were also pretty low. And with strawberries, we're also pretty low. So very, very similar numbers overall. So this is a great food. If you're trying to reverse insulin resistance with a low carb or ketogenic diet, you can still have a handful. Now, if you work on a strawberry picking farm 
and you put one in your mouth for every strawberry you pick, then you could probably get too much of both the sugar and potassium. But if you eat a handful, then you're going to be all right. So we get check marks on those berries. Number 10 recommended food is egg whites. They say it's a low phosphorus source of high quality protein. So let's talk about that. Egg white has really nice numbers here, but I always tell people that you don't really want to eat egg white by itself because nature packaged it together for a reason. And when you eat the whole egg, now you're getting much, much more phosphorus, which could be a problem, but you're getting less of the others. It has a trace amount of sugar, not a problem at all. So here again, it's going to depend on where you are like a stage five would stage five or four would probably want to eat the egg whites and anybody else would probably want to eat the whole egg because you're getting much much better nutrition and the only issue would be that that phosphorus is a little bit high i'm still going to give this question mark because they call it a high quality protein and we need to understand that when you combine the egg white and the egg yolk, it is an excellent source of protein. In fact, it's the best outside of mother's milk. But when you isolate the white egg, you're only absorbing and utilizing about one third. So it's kind of a myth that it should be this great protein source. So if you can at all, then you definitely want to eat the whole egg. But I still put a question mark on that because if you're doing a keto diet to heal your kidneys and reverse diabetes and you eat 10 or 12 or 15 eggs a day, now you're probably going to push that phosphorus a little bit too high. So if you have that issue, then you probably want to limit yourself to two or three or four eggs. 11 is olive oil. They say that it contains heart healthy monounsaturated fats. And I totally agree. When we look at it, uh, I would recommend extra virgin olive oil and even better organic because it's not very expensive these days for, for that. When we look at the minerals, the phosphorus, potassium and sodium, we have very, very low numbers. It's zero to one, basically non-existent. But I wanted to point something out because this is a huge common misconception is that olive oil, which is a plant oil or even a fruit oil, if you want to be strict, has 16% saturated fatty acids and 74% monounsaturated fatty acids. And it is most often compared to other plant oils. So they say this is healthy and all the vegetable oils in the store, they're healthy. But in fact, the fat in extra virgin olive oil is much closer to beef fat than it is other plant oils. So beef actually has 42% monounsaturated fats, which we know are the heart healthy ones. And the saturated obviously is much higher because it's a solid fat. It's part of an animal, just like humans. We store fat this way also but we have a significant amount of monounsaturated fats and the other plant fats basically have no saturated fats. So these two are much closer in relation than olive oil would be to other plant oils. And overall, olive oil is something that definitely gets a check mark, put it on everything. Number 12 is pineapple. They say it contains bromelain, which is an enzyme that may have anti-inflammatory effects. Again, that might be good if inflammation is part of the kidney thing, but again, a kidney diet is about avoiding things that can't get out, so that's a little irrelevant. When we look at the numbers here, the minerals are very low, but the sugar is much too high, so you do not want this on a kidney diet. 13 is cucumber. They say it's low in potassium and a refreshing option for hydration. I would agree with that. Very fresh. And it has very low numbers across the board. So I don't have a problem at all. Eat cucumber. 14 is radishes. And again, have antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties. Just repeating that mantra, whether it's relevant or not for that list. 
And again, very nice numbers, just like cucumber basically. And it gets a check mark, even though it's not something that I personally enjoy very much. But if you do, go for it. 15 is skinless chicken. And they say it's low in phosphorus and high in protein. So skinless chicken would have not super low, but kind of low numbers. And because it's a concentrated food, you're not going to eat as much as you could of something that is more water rich. But why would you eat skinless chicken when there is whole chicken unless you just want it to taste bad? So whole chicken has more fat and that's why they're telling you to eat the skinless. But in fact, the two factors that we're concerned with, the phosphorus and the potassium, are lower in the whole chicken. And also you probably, because the whole chicken has more fat, it's more satisfying. So chances are you would eat a little bit less of it so you control those numbers even better. So I give it a question mark because it's going to depend on how much of it you eat. I don't recommend the skinless over the whole. So I think that you can definitely eat the chicken. It's just going to matter how much of it you eat. And then there's cranberries and they say that it may help prevent urinary tract infections. So cranberries are very often used for anything urinary tract, like bladder infections. And there's some evidence, especially anecdotal, that it can help support everything from the kidney to the bladder. Now, let's look at the numbers, and the numbers are really low over here, but the sugar, even if it isn't really high, I put a question mark there. And why is that? Well, have you ever tasted cranberries straight, right? They're very, very tart. So the only way people are going to eat them is loaded up with sugar served with the Thanksgiving turkey, or they're going to hear about cranberry juice being good for urinary tract infections, and they go to the store and they buy the thing that's almost as sugary as Coca-Cola. So you don't want to do that at all. However, there is a way to get the job done, and that is if you have an issue, then you go buy that concentrated cranberry juice and you only need a teaspoon in, in a big bottle of water. It's pretty expensive, probably $30 or so for a tiny little bottle, but goes a long way. Then you sweeten it with stevia or something similar that's safe to sweeten things with. And then you can drink it and probably get some of these benefits. But if you start consuming things that are more like Coca-Cola, it's not going to do you a lot of good. 17 is buckwheat. And they say that it's a whole grain that is a good source of protein, fiber, and nutrients. What do the numbers say? Well, phosphorus is kind of high. Potassium, sodium is not bad. And the phosphorus... If you're going to eat a lot of it, then it's a problem. If you just eat a tiny bit, then it's not a problem. It's a grain. It's a concentrated food. So you're probably not going to eat an enormous amount. But if we keep in mind that most kidney problems have to do with carbohydrates and insulin resistant, that you're basically carbohydrate intolerant, if you're trying to reverse that, you do not want to go and eat something that is 72% carbohydrate. So an uh, X on that. 18 is eggplant. It says it's low in potassium and a good source of dietary fiber. So we keep hearing these same things and they may be a good thing, but why are they on this list? And the numbers look pretty good. The potassium is the only thing that sticks out a little bit at 229. So if you're just having like some Thai food maybe where they slice a little eggplant in there, not a problem. But if you are using the eggplant as a foundation, like a casserole or a dish, then it could easily become too much of that potassium. So we put a question mark there. Green beans, pretty much the same thing. Low in potassium, a good source of fiber. And the numbers look very, very similar. Same story. If you're a total green bean addict, you're going to eat it by the pound then it could add up, but otherwise you're probably fine. 20 is fish. 
and they say it's an excellent source of omega-3 fat and high quality proteins and I totally agree with that it's a fabulous food and if we take the case of salmon then we see that the phosphorus potassium are pretty good they're they're a little bit on the high end but you are not going to eat all that much you're not going to eat salmon by the pound you're going to have four to six to eight ounces which is about 100 to 200 grams and it's concentrated it's going to give you a lot of satisfaction for a smaller amount so no problem there but if we include fish as an excellent source of good protein then we definitely want to consider beef also and it's just that saturated fat thing that we've been told is bad which isn't true but in fact when it comes to the things that we want to avoid on a kidney diet the beef is actually looking a little bit better there so we're going to give both of these a check mark so when is there still hope for improvement rather than just limiting the consequences and the toxic buildup with stage five unfortunately it is probably too late in most cases there's not a whole lot you can do when it gets that far but it is a very small percentage of the population so we want to understand this so we never let it get to that point you do want to work with a nephrologist which is a kidney specialist and they can measure these levels they can measure your kidney function and let you know when you need some some dialysis or maybe a kidney transplant when it comes to stage three and four though the odds are much better and especially stage four is going to be tough but it is possible to do something with it now it is going to matter if we have a lupus versus an insulin resistance so if it's insulin resistant it is probably more straightforward in just reversing that insulin resistance diabetes situation whereas if it's lupus which is autoimmune then it may or may not be all that easy so I wouldn't give up on it but just know that some things are a little more straightforward and if it is insulin resistance then you definitely want to do some things to reverse that which is keto low carb fasting and there's some very powerful supplements that we're going to talk about also with stage two where you're still having reasonably good kidney function you don't really need to restrict any foods then it's typically pretty straightforward and the supplements when it comes to stage five then there is a possibility it could help some but I wouldn't just go out and buy things off the shelf and try I would want to work with a professional with someone who can measure and monitor know your situation and maybe muscle test and figure out what your body is looking for and this would not be instead of working with a nephrologist because they still need to monitor this very closely in case something changes in stage three and four there are some very powerful supplements and in the clinic I have found some to kind of stand above others and and really be able to to help so Rena food is from standard process renatrophin pmg from standard process and arginex so what do these do well arginex is kind of like a draino a roto rooter it cleans out the the pipes if you will it helps improve circulation it helps break down oxalates and stones it's a great supplement for gout but it also helps everything that can get stuck in the kidney it kind of helps move it through and it has some enzymes it, if you look at the ingredients it doesn't tell the whole story there's more to it there's more activity because they kind of grown it renatrophin is to help repair tissue and it is especially if there's an autoimmune attack on the kidney but also anytime that there is tissue destruction that pmg is going to be very helpful and rena food is a combination of renatrophin pmg and arginex plus it has a few nutrients and other things to support the kidney so in terms of dosage 
I wouldn't recommend that you just go out and, and go crazy, but just know that if you're in stage three or four, you're probably gonna need a little higher dosage than what the labels say. That's just what I find in the clinic for the most part. So probably if you have significant damage, you might wanna try all of these at to together. And then I would take maybe six Rena food, six to 12 Renatrophin PMG, and probably six to 12 Arginex. Again, it's good if you could have someone to help you figure that out. And if you are in stage two of kidney disease, then I would just go with the Rena food, unless you have someone test you who shows a little bit different. And then I would just go with a base recommendation of three for that. 21 is asparagus. It says it contains antioxidants and low in potassium and phosphorus. We look at the numbers, phosphorus is pretty low, potassium not too bad. So again, depends on how much you eat. If you just eat the three little sticks you get in a restaurant, not a problem. If you eat it by the pound, again, you wanna kind of watch out for it. Then we have celery, which they say is low in potassium and is anti-inflammatory. And when we look at the number, it's not all that low in potassium. And if you have a few little sticks with your chicken wings, again, no problem. But if you get into the idea of juicing celery because it's so low in sugar, which wouldn't be a terrible idea, then you could, if you need to restrict potassium, that could build up pretty quickly if you, if you juice it. If you just eat it, you're probably not gonna have a problem. 23 is kale. They say it's a nutrient dense leafy green and it's low in potassium. So that's a good thing, it appears. And it's not all that low in potassium when we look at it. However, it takes a lot of work. These numbers are per 100 grams and it takes a lot of work to eat 100 grams of kale in a salad. So it would take a lot to go over those limits However, again, if you juice it, then you could get more potassium, but it is kind of rough on the body actually to juice kale and drink it kind of straight. I tried that many years ago when I was doing some juice cleansing. And let me tell you, that wasn't real pretty. So if you just eat it in a salad, then you should be totally fine on that. 24 quinoa. It's a protein rich grain that is low in potassium. Let's see how that works. Per 100 grams, it has pretty high phosphorus, pretty high potassium as well. But this is per 100 gram of dry grain. So 100 grams would probably, by the time you cook it, 100 grams is probably a, a pretty sizable serving. But again, these numbers are not super low, we're over 500 milligrams of potassium, you'll probably be all right. But again, the one I'm concerned with is gonna be the carbohydrates. If you're trying to reverse kidney disease, usually that means lowering carbs. So having something that's almost all carb is not a great idea. So we're gonna not put quinoa on the list. And 25 is watermelon. People love to put that on every kind of list. They say it's high in water content and it helps with hydration and it's low in potassium. So let's look at those numbers. So yes, indeed, phosphorus, potassium, sodium is pretty low. Sugar doesn't look terrible with six grams there on the surface. It's sort of like onion. But the question is, how much would you eat of it? Could you eat more watermelon than you could onion? And I would say the answer is probably yes. The other thing is that kind of guides us in that direction is if it helps with hydration. If you're trying to drink, let's just say a half a gallon a day and it's gonna help with hydration, you couldn't just have a little square and it help with hydration it's very, very easy to consume watermelon. You could very easily have a pound or even two. That much of a consumption, let's say you eat two pounds worth, then the potassium could still get up there, but more importantly, that sugar would be way, way off the chart on that. So we're gonna put an X on watermelon also. 
So when it comes to kidney and diet restrictions and recommendations, we have to understand cause versus damage control. If we want to heal something, then we want to address the root cause. But most of the kidney diet has to do with damage control, which means we try to limit the things that the kidney can't get rid of and that would increase toxicity in the body. So the kidney diet, the way it's presented, there are some good points to it, but it applies basically to chronic kidney disease 5, 4, and 3B primarily. And that's only 20% of the people who are classified as chronic kidney disease. All the others, we are more interested in reversing. And once we want to reverse it, we have to understand the root cause. And it's not so much about limiting, it's not at all about limiting the minerals. They are good nutrients. We need the protein, we need the fat, we need all the good things to rebuild tissue. But we want to get rid of the thing that interferes which is insulin that drives the kidney failure, that drives the hypertension, that drives the metabolic syndrome. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.